Radio is magic. At least, that's the only conclusion that I could have drawn when I was 10 years old, and I had just been given a transistor radio for the first time. I remember like it was yesterday, standing in the backyard, took the antenna, pulled it up, turned it on, sound came out of it, music and words. And I'm looking around thinking, where's it coming from, you know? How in the world could invisible waves that were in the air around me make their way down this metal strip and by some sort of alchemy be converted in the box into these sorts of sounds? Well, I was just gobsmacked. I loved radio from that day forward. I was fascinated by it, enthralled. My dad said, you think that's pretty cool? Try the old uh, shortwave radio that used to belong to your grandpa. I said, why, what, is, you know, what does that do? And he says, oh, you just tune around, see what you can hear. Well, what I heard was Radio South Africa, the Deutsche Welle in Germany. I heard the BBC in London. I heard Radio Argentina, Radio Havana, Cuba, Radio Beijing, Moscow, Norway, Sweden. I could hear the entire world with that radio, and it became my best friend. I spent hours in my room, nothing but the little dial light, you know, to light the way, listening and listening and tuning and listening some more, trying to see what I could hear, and at every moment fascinated by this sort of process of waves coming into my bedroom. Well, I decided listening wasn't enough. I wanted to be a part of this whole wonderful process. And so I decided I was going to be an announcer for the Voice of America. I was going to represent the United States as an international broadcaster. I was going to tell the rest of the world about the American dream and play jazz music, you know, and uh, talk to people in Norway. And, so I wrote to the Voice of America, oh, did I tell you that I was 13? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was 13. Bless their heart, they wrote back. Here it is. Postcard from February 8th, 1973. Monica Vallandingham, in her own hand, signed this. This is a picture of the transmitter in Dixon, California. But along with the postcard was a letter, very official stationery from the United States Information Agency. And it said, if you'd like to be an announcer, here's the things you need to do. Probably a form letter, but I didn't care. I kept it for years. It said, you need to get this kind of education, liberal arts, these are the colleges you ought to think about, but most importantly, you need to get some practical experience. All right, well, I can do that. And by the time I was uh, 16, I figured out how. I went to the local radio station, answered an ad. They needed some weekend help. You know, the crack of dawn shifts on Saturday and Sunday morning that nobody else wanted. And by the way, during which nobody was listening, probably. <laughs> they said, hey, you'll be perfect for that. I remember I read a little bit of news as an audition, and they said, great, you're hired. Well, I thought this was the best thing that had ever happened in my life. I mean, I was going to have a producer and an engineer, and together we were going to come up with radio programming that we could be proud of. No. As the manager said to me, uh, sorry, kid, around here we do it all. I wasn't quite sure what all included, but it didn't take me long to find out. In fact, little did I know it, but I was about to be severely traumatized by the radio industry. Let me tell you what I mean. Most of the time we broadcast the same material, the same program on both the AM and the FM station. But on Sunday morning, in order to meet the FCC guidelines for community programming, we would split the two transmitters and we would broadcast pre-recorded religious programs on AM, music on FM, sort of a live show, you know, music, weather, that sort of thing. And I thought, great, well, who will I be working with on Sunday mornings? <laughs> Again, around here, we, we do it all. <laughs> so I found out that I would be running two programs on Sunday morning at the same time from the same chair in the control room. Never in my life, before or since, have I had a job that was more 
pressure-packed, intense, traumatizing. I was 16 years old, and not only had they left me in control of a radio station, they wanted me to run two programs at the same time. So they trained me a little bit, you know, and, and after a while I was on my own. Let me describe the situation. So you've got one control room. On the left were turntables covered with felt. Uh, kids, ask your parents, okay, what a turntable is. Yeah. And they were um, belt driven, of course. Right above was a reel-to-reel -reel machine. Uh, again, ask your parents about that to play uh, pre-recorded tapes. There was a little cassette machine beside of it. In front, I had this long control room panel. Looked like sort of a space control station, and they all had knobs, and every knob controlled a different device. But every device also had two positions, an FM position and an AM position, okay? Are you with me so far? All right. Um, and then, of course, the microphone, FM, AM, FM, AM. Remember, don't do it backwards. Headphones, FM, AM switch, so I could always switch back and forth and see what was going on. And then we had a commercial uh, deck here, we called it. Played little eight tracks for commercials. So this is the way it started. Seven o'clock Sunday morning, my first newscast, it was a live newscast. I had to read it live. It had to be exactly four and a half minutes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have enough time for the two pre-recorded programs on AM to finish by the bottom of the hour when we joined the network. So at exactly four and a half minutes, I ended the news, bam, started the program on AM, reached back here and, uh, uh, oh, I got that backwards. See, I can't even do it at age 57. After the news, I would reach back and I would split the transmitters so that each one of them now had their own signal going out to them. Started the program on AM, started the record on FM. And I would play music and do commercials on FM while the program continued on the AM station. At the quarter hour, though, I had to figure out how to go back to AM, switch the two tapes, you know, to put on the new one, and yet not let the programming run out on the FM at the same time. So that meant I had to have a three or four minute song that I played right as the quarter hour began. I'd flip my headphones back to AM, put in a public service announcement about Girl Scout for 60 seconds. That would give me just enough time to stop the tape machine, plop the reels off the machine, throw them aside, grab the new ones, put them on the machine, curl it up, get it all cued, boom, we're back into the next program now. Well, meanwhile, I flip back to FM and the song is ending. So now I gotta do something. And I figured out that by memorizing weather, I could get a lot accomplished, you know, while I was reading that short little forecast because I didn't have to look at anything. I could be reading the weather and changing the record over here and then reaching over here and getting a, they went kind of like a 76 degrees and a mostly sunny skies forecast for today, for tonight, a low near 55. Tomorrow, a carbon copy of today, high around 75 with lows tomorrow night around 50. Right now, we've got 73 degrees and sunny skies. Boom. Started up the record. Easy, right? Well, that was the point. You had to sound smooth, even though it was pure chaos behind the microphone. I actually had a pastor stop and visit me uh, one Sunday morning while he was waiting to leave a tape. And when I finally got done and closed the mic and turned around and looked at him, the color had drained out of his face. <laughs> And he was standing there with his mouth open. He said, do you do this for six and a half hours? Uh, yeah, and I've got to get back to it, so, you know, see you later. Well, anyway, it was traumatizing. I was 16. It was a lot of pressure for a young kid. And I started having dreams about it. Yeah, nightmares. And my nightmare would be something like, I would leave the control room to go in the other room and get the news or to have a, a cup of coffee or, you know, um, take a break or something. And I'd come back to the control room and the door would be locked. <laughs> and I couldn't get in. And I would pull and pull. I would kick at it and I would shove my arm. Nothing would happen. So I'd figure, well, I'll run into the recording studio and smash the glass between the two rooms, you know. And so I would pick up a chair and I would beat on that glass and beat on it and it wouldn't break. The chair would just bounce off. And then all of a sudden, 
magically, I mean, it's my dream, anything can happen, the manager appears in the control room and he's standing there like this and he's shaking his finger at me like, you get in here. And all I could hear on the speakers, you know, was because all the programming had ended and all we had was dead air. And if you're in radio, dead air is the one thing you don't want to produce. So I went in and talked to him about it after my shift, a couple days later. I said, you know, not only am I having this nightmare, but I'm having it repeatedly. I mean, a couple times a week, sometimes more. You know, it's really bugging me. And I said, is, do you ever have that? Is, is it just me? And he kind of laughed and gave me this knowing smile. And he said, well, welcome to the fraternity. You're just having a dead air dream. You mean it's a thing? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh my God, yeah. He said, we all have them. And he said, my dream, for example, is the short arm dream. And I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, I'll dream that I'm in the control room, the ship's going along just fine, and the record's ending, and my arm's shrink, and they're only six inches long, and I can't change the record, and I, I can't reach the microphone. He says, I wake up screaming. And I said, and you're okay with that? <laughs> well, he said, you know, it comes with the territory. And I was 16, I had a lot of time to decide my career, and I decided that maybe I'd been a little hasty in choosing radio. So anyway, I abandoned the whole dream and went to work for a newspaper as a reporter and photographer and had a, a nice long career as a journalist, really enjoyed it. It was a good career move for me. And, uh, you know, I'm 57, as I mentioned, and I still have the dream. <laughs> and I'm serious about this, and I've had it for 40 years. And I don't just have it, you know, once in a while. I have it pretty doggone frequently. And it changes all. Oh, there's, oh, yeah, I could tell you all different kinds of permutations and changes. But anyway, I asked my uh, therapist about it. <laughs> yeah. She, being the positive person that she is, said, well, why don't you consider it a positive? She said, why don't you think about it as an early warning sign, maybe a red flag? Because when you're having this dream, you're most likely anxious about something when you go to sleep, and maybe it's a warning that you ought to think about that and try and resolve it when you're awake. Okay, I can go with that, I said. Yeah, she said, just think about it as an early warning, a positive thing. So I guess that even though I've given up my dream about being in radio as an announcer, I've come to embrace the nightmare that the pursuit of the dream has given me. 